Welcome to the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry. And today we're visiting with a good buddy of mine, Nick Domenico, the founder of Elk Run Farm and the co-founder of Drylands Agroecology Research. Hey, Nick, how you doing, man? Hey, doing pretty good. Hello, everybody. Glad yeah. to be on with you. Yeah, likewise, man. I'm, I'm psyched to have this chat with you today. And we've got so much to chat about with respect to the work you're doing in the regenerative agriculture and regenerative culture movements. And uh, yeah, just really looking forward to being able to share your story with our audience. Heck yeah, appreciate it, Aaron. Right on. Hailing from the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, Nick is a regenerative designer, farmer, and builder. Inspired by indigenous culture and ancient farming practices, he works passionately to design the future of living systems. In 2015, Nick began farming on a barren and desertified 14-acre parcel of land in rural North Boulder County, which is where we are currently, now called Elk Run Farm. Also, this is the pilot research project for Drylands Agroecology Research, or DAR. Today, Nick is working to develop climate change solutions through regenerative farming, working with private and public landowners across Boulder County. And so Nick, we uh, have uh, a deep connection, obviously, with Why on Earth having headquarters here at Elk Run Farm and mm -hmm. us uh, living in community together these last couple of years, which has just been a, an extraordinary experience. And uh, it's, to me, remarkable to witness all that is unfolding here on this property under your leadership. And what's, what's really amazing is that we're sitting in a, in a beautiful, lush, abundant garden but that this was truly a, a really barren and, and beat down uh, land not too many years ago. And I was wondering yeah. to kick things off, could you, could you describe for us, you know, what this place was like when, when you first got here? Yeah, sure thing. So this was a rental property for many years. Uh, it appeared as though there had been cattle management many years before that. There was some old infrastructure like a cattle chute behind that was all kind of falling over and most likely pretty overgrazed by cattle for years before and as far as we know nobody had ever tried to grow crops here um, there's not ditch rights here so the water situation is pretty minimal so it wasn't really looked at as an agricultural property um, my family acquired the land originally just to restore some of the buildings and fix it up. And I decided to start farming here and it was been, it's been like a beautiful experimentation of how to use regenerative agriculture practices and especially design intensive, like thoughtful, holistic design to build systems that would restore the land. Um, and that was really my inspiration to come here to do that. And there, the bottom five acres was completely desertified. There was no topsoil, no vegetation. There was a large colony of prairie dogs, which is kind of a controversial issue in Boulder County where we are. Um, but really the prairie dogs and that damaged ecosystem was just like a representation of what's possible in Boulder County, what's happening on a lot of different parcels of land too. Something not very uncommon around here. Um, and we started using different practices. Uh, I have brought NRCS out in 2015. That's, That's the, the natural... Uh, natural, natural resource conservation services, yeah. a, par a department of the USDA started uh, after the Dust Bowl in the 1930s to help farmers and ranchers conserve resources on land in America. And, you know, originally I asked them, hey, I showed them around, showed them the different conditions of the site, asked them what kinds of conservation practices should I use? I'm a beginning farmer, really excited to grow here, really excited to run livestock. And they basically said, you know, we don't have a lot for you. We don't have a lot of practices that can actually repair this land. We think it's better if you go farm somewhere else. Wow. So that was a little disheartening at the time, but it really stoked this inspiration to develop these different practices that we're using now. I suppose successfully, you know, it's mm -hmm. been, been some years now, seven years since I moved here and a lot of beauty has occurred. A lot of community has now joined us here in what we're doing. And we were able to feed a lot of people off this land that was considered marginalized, was considered you know, useless for agriculture by, by common understanding until we began working it. So that's just a little bit of the background I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, and, and look, I, not only is this desertification happening in in this specific area boulder county uh next to the rocky mountains in colorado but this is happening all around the world in many different 
situations and localities. And so, you know, from, from my perspective, much of what you're doing here is not only applicable right here in Boulder County and in the semi-arid Rocky Mountain West, but really in, in places all around the, the world. Yeah. And I know you're yeah. increasingly connecting with folks um, in other regions of the planet. And uh, I'm so excited to know that there's more and more collaboration getting underway there. But uh, before we kind of talk about this global context, uh, tell me, like, what are what are you growing here? I mean, I, I I know I get to see this so often in the. Yeah. The, by the way, the soil itself is this amazing, almost pulsing, rich, dark, chocolate cake, fluffy soil now, and it wasn't like that a few years ago, right? So, so yeah, d maybe describe for us what's what's being grown here, and uh, you know, plants and animals. Yeah, definitely. So. We're sitting here in the forest garden, which we always saw as like the nucleus of the property. I thought of it in this kind of way, like if we could bring fertility and an ecosystem into the nucleus, that would spread throughout the property. And so that's really where we begun working, really with this forest ecology model in mind. So dug this forest garden, dug the contour swales that now collect the gray water and the rainwater from the house and begun planting perennial crops, so different fruiting and berry crops that create this natural ecosystem and then planting it with other um, beneficial plants, uh, flowers and other th plants that uh, bring bugs that work against the other pests and things like that. Mm -hmm. But basically we're growing fruit crops as the overstory in this forest garden and then while uh, the canopy is developing we're growing vegetable crops sort of in the alleys between the contour swales and that's helping to build soil using these no-till gardening practices that we're using so all the vegetables that we grow on this property are in this forest garden here and then we are also uh, growing staple grain crops so mostly bioregional crops um, I originally got those seeds from Rich Pecoraro of Masa Seed Foundation, one of the elder seed farmers and, and seed libraries in this area, and got from him some of the most drought tolerant grains that we could th that he knew of, and especially the Southwest um, traditional foods, really. Uh, so blue corn, amaranth, and dry beans. We uh, tested a couple different varieties and then settled on. Hopi black beans, and then we've been breeding his Chihuahua blue. <clears throat> so those are all in breeding trials and grown in drylands fields just a little bit south of here. And then there's uh, rows of contour swales in between those fields also that create these moist microclimates and hedgerows to block wind. And then at the same time, we are raising sheep on pasture in regenerative systems, and then the pigs really were a major force here for a long time, and now our, our pig herds are on other properties, which is pretty cool. We use the pigs to build a lot of soil and to prepare the ecosystems for later planting, which is really neat. Just use, like, utilizing this concept that um, directing livestock to certain areas with certain goals in mind of ours to transition the ecosystems into more fertile places for growing. So pigs were used for a lot of that. And then we have chickens for eggs in mobile coops. And then we have ducks that hang out in the ponds. Um, and then deer and elk come through the property, which is pretty neat as well. Um, and then at the same time, we've been able to establish over a thousand fruit and useful trees in the dryland systems um, as a way to create ecosystemic resilience, uh, to create food and habitat for livestock. It's been really beautiful to see that. That's, I think, one of our claims to fame, I suppose, is the thousand trees that have been established without supplemental irrigation. And so at the same time, we're breeding those drought tolerant uh, silvopasture and agroforestry crops for use on other projects as we continue to grow and expand, which is pretty neat too. And I think it's important just to mention that this site has really been an experimentation site for a long time and now a demonstration of these dry lands restoration techniques using agroecology as an overarching concept and especially nestled in holistic design methodologies yeah it's so great like not only is the forest garden here a nucleus for this farm uh really elk run as a demonstration has become a nucleus in a broader ecosystem here with a number of other farms and properties and even some public lands where you're now doing this regenerative work mm -hmm. over a lot of additional acreage 
right? And so uh, th there's this great ecosystem, community ecosystem of other farmers and other stakeholders who you, you've really helped anchor and uh, catalyze what is really a movement occurring here in this part of the county now. Mm, and uh, and I, I'm wondering, you know, if you might share with us a little bit about what, what's that like for you as you're going to other sites and working with other landscapes and uh, dreaming, envisioning and designing what, what's possible on these other properties. Yeah, it's been really cool. So you know, it's been three or four years now since some landowners began kind of knocking on our door, intrigued at least and sometimes impressed by what we've been able to create with such little water. I mean, just for context too, all the water for this property comes from a 40 foot deep well, often runs dry as Aaron knows too. Sometimes we go to turn on sink water, shower water, and nothing, nothing comes out. Irrigated a little too much the night before, you know? So there's been a lot of boundaries, challenges, like uh, restrictions on this property. And so it's been really amazing getting to design bigger systems on bigger properties, sometimes with irrigation, you know, at times people come to us and want to develop regenerative patterning, right? So build systems where regenerative farming can plug into quickly and easily that really models natural ecosystems. And so that's been super fun. And then just starting to get into this world of, okay, the city and the county or different landowners have these parcels of land that are incredibly dry, incredibly barren, can't be leased for agriculture, can't be used in any agricultural models that are commonplace in this area right now. And so just being able to pioneer these new systems uh, and di like starting with design and then implementation of systems that continuously upgrade the land, even if there aren't people tending and managing the land. But then of course, in, like very strongly stoked by management, especially livestock. So really following in the footsteps of Al Alan Savory's models and using holistic management and regenerative uh, rotational grazing patterns to restore land. And that's been really exciting too. And just really, again, with this concept that the trees and the shrubs anchor the ecosystem. So building perennial systems that can support pollinators and uh, support wildlife like birds and just create these thriving, thriving agricultural ecosystems that continuously produce more and more food every year. So that's been really cool. And, and our dream is to see all of Boulder County utilizing regeneratively grown meat that's sinking carbon every year, that's continuously building ecosystems and demonstrating how using these practices, we can actually reverse desertification over large acreage just by using these design methodologies with the plantings, the contour swales to collect, store and distribute water. And I think that's something important to talk about too that really sets us apart from most too is just using holistic um, water management strategies, especially terraforming to collect and store moisture, which creates uh, soil conditions viable for planting trees where otherwise that wouldn't be possible. And then a lot of the patterning that we use is in these contour systems. So then running the livestock through contour alleys and building soil fertility using the livestock um, and then cropping thereafter where it's appropriate. And it's been really cool. We have some bigger partners locally. All of our pigs right now are at Metacarbon Organic Farm, which is just across the street. So it's pretty fun if you go to the top of our hill, you can look over and see beyond our gates, beyond our contour swales and trees in the distance, another 10 or so acres of contour swales at Metacarbon. And our pigs are over there preparing a dry pasture field that uh, Hardy, our partner, wants to turn into vegetable production. So just these really lo low input um, systems that will eventually grow a lot of veg, which is really neat too. And then using the livestock integration interseasonally to clear and fertilize the fields, which is really neat. So that's limiting tractor use, limiting uh, carbon, carbon output. Um, and then over at Yellow Barn Farm, another big partner of ours, we just got big grant funding to design the back 60 acres of that property. So the next really large drylands silvo pasture demonstration there this idea that silvo pasture is the concept of, of planting trees within pastures or in more uh, wet areas turning woodlands into silvo pastures by thinning trees but in this area for us it's really like planting trees within pasture um, to create food and habitat for livestock and really anchor the ecosystems like i've been saying so it's been really cool just being watching the patterns grow outside of our gate and seeing how it's thriving in a lot of different conditions locally, which has been really neat.
Yeah, it's it's so tremendous. And and look, I don't I don't know if the cameras or the uh, mics are picking up any of the. We got some kids. Uh, it sounds a little upset in the background. And one of the other things happening with the organization and with the property is a uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, folk farm school for the little ones who from the community here get this really special experience of basically being outside all of the time that they're here um, experiencing the animals and the landscape the plants learning about different uh, pl plant edible plants and herbs and mm -hmm. and yeah. uh yeah it's 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 wild and of course it's not exactly funny but sometimes uh you know we get to hear the kiddos uh, getting a little upset or whatever's <laughs> yeah. going on and miss jess and the rest of the team do such a good job of helping helping the youngsters learn some of these emotional management skills and uh, sort of embodied uh, awareness skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a yeah. parent, I, I really marvel at and, and admire and respect the work that those teachers are doing with those kiddos. And I know that it's just another way in which you guys have created a hub for the community here. So, you know, not only are these kiddos <laughs> getting to experience this land and, and ecology but of course their parents as they're coming and going each day also get to mm -hmm. have an experience yeah. that's perhaps a little different from their you know otherwise day-to-day -day reality and uh so yeah it's it's really amazing to me nick the way you guys have layered in so many functions right to to kind of borrow a permaculture idea of stacked functions you've layered in so many functions to this to this property yeah and uh, to this area this region and look like when when you're doing these installs on other properties like we did a season or two ago at uh, yellow barn farm several yeah. of us got together and planted i don't know how many hundreds of trees and uh, it was a great fun time there's a food truck and I think some music and you know it was yeah, a real yeah. it was a really like wonderful weekend experience for all of us who were there and we managed to help basically install a significant part of this uh, alley cropping al uh, agro forestry silvopasture system that, yeah. that you've designed there and I wanted to ask uh, you're, you're throwing out some terms and I heard you um, you know describing the agro forestry silvopasture piece I, I want to ask you to describe the terraforming as well, and also a term we haven't yet mentioned called stun. I, I think nah, this is yeah. a really interesting way to cultivate <clears throat> certain uh, certain plants in these systems. Definitely. So maybe you could tell us a bit more about what does terraforming mean, and then what's the stun method? Yeah, totally. Which reminds me, I mean, that term came from Mark Shepard, so I think just just for context to explain like where we got the inspiration to use these models and where like the tele terraforming and water management systems came from. And Mark Shepard is a farmer up in Wisconsin and he was one of Bill Mollison's original students in the 80s. And he, Bill Mollison being the founder of the permaculture movement, right? With the exactly, original yeah. literature and all of that. Exactly, yeah. So, you know, Bill Mollison, from my understanding, collected a lot of understandings and learnings from different indigenous tribes all over the world and was really fascinated by traditional farming practices and started this movement where uh, called permaculture uh, and I'm sure there's many, many more resources on that people could explore but um, Mark Shepard was one of his original students and was really excited to expand the permaculture philosophy and build systems that were agriculturally focused and at scale that were profitable at scale and so Mark Shepard wrote a book called Restoration Agriculture, um, and I've had the opportunity to learn and, and uh, receive teaching from him and just utilizing this restoration ag model, which the, the, the first, the beginning of that, of using that model is really shaping the land to collect, store, and distribute all the moisture that falls on the property. Uh, and in wetter climates, at times that means diverting water, so there's not flooding or topsoil erosion and things like that. But the terraforming concepts that we use really come from Mark Shepard and the permaculture kind of framework in that as, sheep, as water is flowing down the hill, it can either be an erosive force or a force for good in that we need that moisture to grow the plants and the crops that we want to, to raise and cultivate. And so again, using this idea of key line design. Mm -hmm. These are concepts that Bill Mollison and Mark Shepard were really inspired by. So collecting and storing water high in the landscape and then slowly dispersing it outwards across the slope. So with the concept that water is usually 
uh, moving in wet valleys. And so if we're able to collect and store water high, we can distribute that water onto the dry ridges on the property and just create way more opportunity for cultivation basically. And that really lays the groundwork. So those are all really intensively designed systems and then dug either by hand or with machinery. Um, so these small basins that we call contour swales, like a, a ditch on the contour of the land that slows and spreads the moisture and then creates a location that we can plant perennial crops like trees and shrubs. Um, and then Mark Shepard came up with this concept called STUN, right? Sheer, total, utter neglect. So this concept that we're not really babying anything that we're planting or growing here. We're just witnessing, watching, observing what's thriving, what's doing well. And in a way, this has created a really wonderful opportunity for us when we began planting th these thousand or so trees on contour. We had no idea if they would grow or succeed or not. And so we planted them very dense, like about a foot apart, assuming we would lose at least half the trees. And amazingly, in year one, we had less, lost less than 15% of them, which really shocked and stunned us, as well as the other folks in the area, especially other farmers that really discouraged me from practicing these techniques, thinking that would be a big expenditure of resources and not be fruitful. And what's amazing is that the trees have grown really well and set in motion a breeding program. So as the years go on, we'll be able to select and then breed and cultivate what does well here in these really intense, harsh, dry conditions. And then those crops will be what we use later to plant on other projects. And so creating this huge opportunity to develop agroforestry crops for drying and drought prone areas, which has been really neat too. Um, I don't think agroforestry is a, a, it's not really utilized much in drier areas where trees don't grow as easily. And so we're using these terraforming techniques to m create opportunity to grow many more trees that again, really anchor the ecosystem, create moist microclimates and all the other ecosystemic functional benefits that allow us to grow crops and livestock more easily in difficult conditions. Yeah, that's really so interesting. You know, it's reminded me, I learned something um, when I was, uh, interviewing Tom Chi uh, at One Ventures, and, and he's an, a remarkable technologist and uh, investor who is finding these technology opportunities to help restore coral reefs, to help oh, wow. on a massive scale replant parts of the uh, tropical rainforests around the world. And one of those plays is a a drone seed planting technology. Huh. And I was asking Ooh. him, well, what, what are the success, the germination, the survival rates of the seeds you're putting in the ground? And I, I forget exactly what the numbers were. They're actually also pretty high. Wow. But he said, and, and by the way, what are we comparing to as a baseline? He said, because in nature, you know, trees and plants are dropping huge quantities of seeds in general yeah and and only a small percentage of those is typically going to mature into a a, a big uh tree like this one what is this oh it's apple. a crab apple crab that we apple. grafted with apple yeah and, you know and so okay interesting if we're looking to nature as the example um that that's quite quite uh quite different probably than when we're thinking about conventional agriculture yeah. and we're sort of pushing for that last percent of yield all the time. And I'm, I'm just, I'm struck because what happens in this stun method in these drylands environments, right, is those trees and shrubs that do get established and do get going after a couple few years are so hardy. Yeah. They're, they're essentially ready to tolerate kind of anything get, that gets thrown at them or so it seems. Yeah. And so this is also, I think, a really important strategy for resilience building in these uh, regions of the world and, and virtually all the world right now is at risk where we're anticipating greater extremes and weather patterns <clears throat> and, and uh, climatic shifts and so on. And I, I guess I want to ask um, in that uh, related to that, uh, what are you seeing in the way of policy conversations and even uh, some of the funders you're working with as these strategies and solutions being uh, specifically uh, apropos for uh, climate stabilization and dealing with things like uh, water uh, in time and carbon uh, sequestration and so on. Like, yeah. how, is that a big part of your guys' conversation? Yeah, definitely. I mean, from our research, we're understanding that 
about 40% of the Earth's surface has been degraded by human influence. Mm -hmm. And so most of those areas are what Alan Savory would call brittle ecosystems, places that if, if degraded to a certain point, kind of start to roll towards desertification. And so there's many places on Earth that are facing the same crises that we are. And just with the industrialized food models that are so prevalent on Earth right now, it's like food can be brought long distances to places that have already been desertified. But really understanding that by having local food everywhere people are, especially in desertifying places, we can really build huge resilience in our communities. And, and also understanding that the health of the land really is the health of a community. You know, when you really boil it down, um, and in a way, like, our values as a culture on earth maybe have strayed away from that and valuing other things but really all natural resource comes from the health of the land and so in these practices we are growing food resiliently in really difficult conditions that were otherwise not seen as applicable for growing food and at the same time building resource in our communities uh, building skills by bringing other people onto the sites and projects to learn about it um, yeah, there's just huge opportunity to implement these practices all over the world for, for major benefit to society and humankind as we know it. Yeah, absolutely. And now I'm, I'm also reminded of our mutual friend and colleague, John Liu, who, yeah, who helped establish the global uh, ecosystem restoration camp movement, right? And yep. I remember learning from him that the Sinai Peninsula, you know, that whole region um, had a very different uh, Gulf Stream flow of air and moisture off of the Indian Ocean. Mm, yeah. And it was probably because of these human impacts of desertification that that all shifted so that it became even more extreme uh, in its uh, drought and uh, desert uh, situation. But the good news is there are efforts underway in places like Sinai and elsewhere nearby like in egypt there's an oh, ecosystem yeah. restoration camp there that's doing extraordinary work of uh literally reforesting and greening the desert wow. and so you know one of the things i'm really struck by uh thinking about some of these marginal and, and risk areas like we have here and then places that have already been so extremely desertified that it's a, a matter of really bringing them back really restoring regenerating and healing those in yeah. a ma major way and I'm curious, I, I know that so much of your, your work and your focus is right here in this area, and thank goodness, right? Yeah. Um, and may the world have a whole lot of Nick D. Dominicos and mm -hmm. lots of other places. Sure. But uh, also, how do you see yourself in time in the coming months and years and maybe decades, um, you know, helping to expand and proliferate your work and knowledge and expertise into other regions of the world that might benefit from that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, for us, we've caught some interest and have some potential projects in Ecuador, a potential project in Baja California, and you know, there's many places on earth that have been degraded yeah. and mostly by industrial culture. So we're just excited to see how that grows. And right now we're just stabilizing in our local communities and in our local county here in Boulder County. I mean, there's just so much to do right around us right now that it seems like that's what's captivating most of our focus, but in the years to come, we're really excited to start taking projects other places and involving local place-based cultures in the, in the um, work that we're doing and just really bring in, nurture, and support communities to live in healthy, thriving ecosystems where their food is growing close by, and especially lifting up and utilizing uh, bioregional food crops from the different areas that we want to work in. So. We'll see where it all goes, but we're, we're excited. And so more on that soon, I'd say. Right on. That's great. Yeah, Nick. Well, and look, you've, you've uh, also really connected deeply to a lot of the indigenous people and indigenous cultures of this region. Yeah. And, and I'm so excited uh, to, to hear from you uh, what, what that process and that part of your adventure over the last few years has looked like. Yeah. And how has that informed what you're up to. I know you had some really tremendous experiences in the Amazon in Peru. Yeah. Obviously not local here yeah, in Colorado, totally. <laughs> but, but you've also uh, cultivated some very deep and beautiful relationships with indigenous elders and wisdom keepers and others uh, here right in this region. Can you share a bit with us about that? Yeah, definitely. And for me, I think my path towards land stewardship really began when I was in South America and 
I left what I was doing in the United States, left a competitive skiing career that I was deeply involved in and sort of had an existential crisis and left and went to South America just to immerse in indigenous culture and learn about different medicine traditions and study and practice. And interestingly enough, what I found there were off-grid communities and some of them beginning to implement permaculture design practices. And I was just a kid at the time, but it really left an impression on me. And so after some years living and working around there, I came back up into the United States and really inspired by traditional indigenous ceremony of North America and especially Plains native culture. So Southwest Plains and then up, you know, these different tribes, um, Cheyenne, Arapaho, um, Apaches, different ones that used to roam these areas uh, in, the, in the recent past that we're living in now. And just seeing that their, their ceremonial culture and their, um, their understanding of elemental forces and how, how life is, these are just inherent patterns that, that all of nature is, is following with. And so just learning about their techniques of prayer and like really technologies of prayer, I would call it, that have inspired mm-hmm. how I approach all living things, how I approach the land, how I approach people, and just these really fundamental and foundational understandings that help me navigate in this world today. Um, and just this inspiration to want to be close to the land. It's such a, mm-hmm. it's such a, goes beyond values. It's like a way of being, it's a way of living, it's a way of thinking that's just in respect and reciprocity with all of nature. Um, and so then of course, paying homage to these different tribes and communities as well and supporting them how we can. Uh, we have a really cool food sovereignty project just beginning on the Shoshone reservation up in uh, Wind River. And that's been really exciting to just support them beginning to grow their native foods again and to use livestock in like a more um, innovative way. Um, you know, not as much traditional for them, but using livestock to develop land that they can then garden and just be able to take care of themselves again, be able to rely on their own food sovereignty to support their tribal communities and everything that they do, which has been really beautiful to see. But it's just been such a deep part of how we move, how we live in life. And so I'm really thankful for those relationships and getting to practice those traditions in ceremonial ways. And it's been really fun to be able to bring that to the land and to our communities that we work in as well. So absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what an amazing and rich experience and opportunity and you're helping suffuse some of that wisdom and knowledge into other parts of the community and culture here with those deep connections that you have with many of the indigenous communities. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful, Nick. Thanks, Amy. Let me, uh, let me remind our audience. This is the why on earth community podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry. Today we're visiting with Nick D. Domenico, the founder of Elk Run Farm and the co-founder of Drylands Agroecology Research. You can find a lot more information about DAR at dar.eco, that's D-A-R dot E-C-O. Uh, on social media, you'll find Nick and Marissa and the rest of the team uh, putting out a lot of great posts at, uh, at Drylands Agroecology. And um, I wanna also take a quick moment to thank a few of our partners. We've got Purium, the organic uh, f- superfoods company. Yeah, we're enjoying some Purium right now. As a matter of fact, some can't beat this in cocoa hydrate. It's amazing and delicious. <laughs> and we've got a special partnership <clears throat> with Purium so that anyone in our network or our audience can get a $50 uh, discount on an initial purchase or 25% off, whichever is a greater amount. When you go to whyonearth.org slash Purium, and you're going to find a whole variety of uh, dried uh, organic superfoods basically coming from really well-managed and regenerative farms uh, in a variety of different locations. Waylay Waters, of course, uh, is one of our uh, social enterprises, regeneratively and biodynamically grown hemp-infused aromatherapy soaking salts, which oh, yeah. I know a lot of us around here uh, enjoy and appreciate. I had one just the other day. I was feeling sore and tired and mm. just needed to recuperate a little bit. Yeah, waylaywaters.com, of course. Got to throw in a quick mention to uh, my new book, Veriditas, this uh, epic visionary eco-thriller, in part because Nick's actually in the story and uh, (laughs) the characters, Brigitte, Sophia, and her not really friend at first, this guy, Leo, and yeah, this is probably a love story. You know what's going to happen, but they end up coming to Elk Run Farm 
And uh, this is part of her experience of awakening and opening up to what's really possible, what's really going on right now in the world that many of us in our city lives, our industrial lives, our hyper technology oriented lives might not even realize, you know, what's really happening in the world right now. And so a big part of the story Veriditas uh, is revealing that sort of thing to you as a reader. So veriditasbook.com. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about that. And of course, uh, our other podcast episodes, we mentioned Tom Chi and John Liu. We've got a lot of other wonderful episodes for you. So be sure to check that out, whyonearth.org uh, slash community dash podcast will get you there. And Nick, are there any other like web or URL resources on your end that we should mention? Um, I think the main Instagram handle we use is elkrun.farm. So mostly uh, yeah. just posting for this farm. And that's really a beautiful way to get to see what's happening on our pilot research project and demonstration site and keep photos of the kids and the ducklings and all kinds of fun stuff like that to inspire your gardening and homesteading efforts. Yeah. The, and the ducklings are ultra cute. <laughs> um, this is, uh, so much fun, Nick. And you know, I, we, we could be talking for hours and hours and, and we often do. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm really excited too, that our organizations are actually, launching some collaborations to help bring even more uh, resources out to folks uh, that, that hopefully can help in this global emerging regenerative movement. Mm, yeah, and uh, really definitely. grateful we have that, that opportunity to collaborate. I, I wanna ask you, because you mentioned, and uh, we both grew up in Colorado, I think you're a true native. Uh, are you a true native? I grew up in Boulder, yeah. You grew, yeah, yep. and uh, the skiing thing. So, so you were deep in, in competitive skiing and then uh, turned away from that and into some other things. Um, what's your relationship like with these mountains? And, mm. and as we're recording, it's yeah. beautiful kind of late summer, early autumn, and you know we're, we're getting ready, anticipating there might be some snow on its way in the coming weeks. And, hey, hold on now. You know, not quite, <laughs> what, yeah, we'll see. Not we'll quite see, yet. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, what, you know, what's that like? That seasonality around here is obviously yeah. pretty significant, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, the mountains, you know, I've grown up along these, these foothills here my whole life and tried my best to make a way away from the mountains, but always mm -hmm. found myself back here. And for me, just being able to go up into the hills and pick medicines and be in nature and just feel the, feel the, the essence and the inspiration of what comes from the natural habitats has been so inspiring to me. And just as homesteaders too, it's just so important to be in rhythm with the seasons too. You know, right about now we're starting to collect our firewood and stack it, you know, we're starting to process our foods, make our salsas and our jams and our chutneys for the years to come, for the next year to come, you know, and putting away all of our food and preparing for the winter. And in a way there's, uh, you know, melancholy bittersweet feeling around that you know as the season begins to close but then also the the excitement around like a good long resting time in the winter which has been really nice for me too so for us it's just such an integral part of watching the seasons and just being staying connected to that and how our food culture really moves around the seasons so it's been really cool yeah yeah absolutely man yeah, it's been fun for me to witness some of the cyclicality, the seasonality around here. And yeah, in the winter months, it can get pretty pretty quiet and, and really tranquil. I mean, it's almost like a meditation retreat, <laughs> yeah, right? Totally. And in the summer months, I probably wouldn't describe it that way uh. with all kinds of folks coming and going in events. And yeah, I mean, one of the other things we didn't talk about yet is the way in which Elk Run Farm has become a cultural hub for a variety of uh, festivals like equinox and solstice celebrations and yeah. dance parties and all sorts of workshops that you guys are putting on and I really encourage folks if, if you haven't yet to plug in and come and check out some of the workshop offerings that Nick and his team have there's a, an amazing array of uh, knowledge sharing and uh, experiential learning available mm, yeah. and uh, yeah and these dance parties are a lot of fun right man? <laughs> sure enough yeah i mean there's just really no way to talk about all the cultural stuff without mentioning marissa too my yeah. amazing partner yeah. life partner and uh co-founder of drylands agroecology research and i think it's worth mentioning you know the way i see it that what really initiated the founding of dar was her skills and my skills kind of combining you know being a really strong influence in the community, a dancer, performer, uh, event producer. 
she decided she wanted to throw a party to help bring funds and resource and attention to what we were doing, which at the time was planting trees on this property that now people can come back and see the plants that they planted. And it's really incredible to see that success that's coming from that. But just really seeing how community has fueled this entire project, the entire work of, of DAR. And like Marissa would say, just really embodying this feeling of joy and, and living in positivity and really sharing that with the greater community. So it's been amazing to have volunteer days once a week where everybody comes and has an amazing lunch afterwards, good farm fresh food and just feeling that excitement. You know, we have offsite interns that come twice a week. We have onsite interns that are training and learning how to do um, practice regenerative farming here and community has just been the the momentum the entire time and so for us like having parties uh, you know here and again once a quarter at most really big big wild parties and yeah. good time to let loose and to really just let go of the season behind us and to celebrate all the beauty that we get to live in you know the beautiful privilege that it is to live on land and to be able to share that with our communities so yeah. in that same way the different ones that support us and fund our projects and also just come to lend a hand and the different volunteer uh, things that you were talking about like the tree planting so if anybody's around Boulder County next spring we're going to do another large tree planting at Yellow Barn and then a couple more plantings at private projects too so really involving the community to get behind this regenerative movement and and see that that proliferation of these regenerative practices using community so it's been a really fun time for that it's so wonderful Nick yeah and I I love it and uh, you know I'm not much for going to these really big uh concerts or whatever anymore i just i'm a little i, I guess i've grown a little sensitive over the years <laughs> but the the kinds of gatherings and celebrations and parties that occur here are just perfect i mean they're just so perfectly scaled perfectly curated and yeah marissa uh, obviously brings such a energy of of joy and and beauty and creativity and cultural connection to the mm. to the project and the property and i'm excited because we decided we would do a his and hers uh set of podcast episodes right so um we're not exactly sure which one's going to drop first but we are recording first with you nick and <laughs> so theoretically i guess it might go in that sequence and uh, yeah it's going to be a lot of fun for our audience i think to be able to hear from each of you mm, yeah. uh, your perspectives and offerings and highlights you know of what what you're holding what you're stewarding what you're creating and, and what you're excited about yeah yeah so just nick what a joy to have this opportunity to visit with you today and, and before we sign out sign off with our podcast episode and go into our behind the scenes segment, which if you'd like to access, you got to become an ambassador. Um, we'll do a little behind the scenes piece and get into a <laughs> few other threads. But uh, before we sign off with our podcast episode, yeah. I just want to invite you if there's anything else you'd like to say or share with our audience or generally, you know, about the work you're doing. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot, Aaron. I mean, I think it's just important to share through Drylands Agroecology Research DAR we really see this, this land regeneration piece as the foundation, right? In the hopes of and the inspiration that Marissa and I have and all of our community members now in building this regenerative culture, seeing that we are mostly living in degraded landscapes. And so if we want to live in a thriving, resilient way, we really need to work on regenerating the landscapes that we're a part of first. Uh, and so then from there, recognizing that by researching that, by doing active data collection and really documenting effectively how these processes are developing the land, we can then share that with other community members, other farmers, ranchers, and also share it to the greater community. And then from that, really recognizing that without, see, we, we have to see that many cultures and marginalized communities have been placed on degraded ecosystems. Mm. And this is just one part of our culture that's kind of challenging to face at times, but recognizing that if we're not reintegrating these communities and supporting these communities and building regenerative systems, then we're, we're really not making a, an influence on culture in a, in a positive way. Mm. And so from there, 
educating people about that, educating people about the work on the land, the work in communities and sharing different permaculture classes that we have here, different events and workshops, mindfulness events that we have on this property as well as Yellow Barn. So those four pillars are really the main, the main pillars of DAR, Drylands Agroecology Research and the work that we're doing in our communities. And definitely excited to hear what Marissa has to say about mm. uh, all this stuff too. The, the cultural advocacy part portions and the education portions are more what she's focused on and involved in. And just through our teamwork and partnership, we've been able to just share a lot of this with the greater community. And so just excited to continue that work and to plant thousands more trees this spring and the years to come and see these regenerative patterns really grow and, and affect and influence culture in a really positive way where we live and, and outward into the world. So just really happy to be with you here. Thanks for honoring me in this way and getting to spend a little time in our, our magical forest garden and talk a little bit. So just feeling thankful now. Absolutely, Nick. Yep. Thank you, man. It's been wonderful chatting yeah. with you today. Sure thing, bro. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code WHYONEARTH, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.